My name is Monk Rowe, and this is the Hamilton College uh, Phileas Jazz Archive. I have John Fedchak with me today, and um, thanks for coming. Sure. In the middle Glad of a, I can make it. Yeah. I, I think you were uh, reading about you. You, to me, you're the very definition of a working musician. Okay. <laughs> I try to. <laughs> can you describe? Uh, well, it's Thursday. Just past the middle of the week. What is a typical week like for you as a working musician? There really is no typical week. That's the, the typical is there's no typical. Um, it really depends on the time of year. It could be, uh, you know, I could be traveling, doing something at a school. I could be overseas. I could be home writing. I could, uh, you know, be working in Manhattan. I could be uh, just practicing and, you know, getting my honing my craft, I guess you could say. So it really is no typical Thursday. And do you like it that way? I do. I do. Uh, when I first moved to New York, um, I did anything and everything, as one would want to do when you move to a new city, uh, including Broadway and commercial work and uh, a lot of non, I guess you could say non-creative type of things where you're, you're they just need someone to come in and play trombone or someone to write a certain number of measures or whatever. Um, but uh, through my past experiences touring with Woody Herman and, and other people, um, I just, you know, I, I had really worked toward that my entire life. And after getting off the road, it will, to me it would seem silly to just let it go and have that be part of the past, all that stuff I have accomplished and, and just just start banging it out like, you know, uh, assembly line kind of, you know, music and things like that. Obviously it's not all like that in the commercial world, but I've, I kind of wanted to keep like a little of that creative freedom going. By banging it out, do you mean like, you know, getting a, 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 a pit pan pit band job for the Lion King and like just doing that until... Yeah, basically. I mean, I have one friend, um, who's been playing Lion King since it opened in 1998. Um, you know, and you know, that can, that can get to your psyche. <laughs> when I first moved to New York, oh, within the first few weeks, I was doing a gig uh, and sitting next to someone uh, who had been playing uh, Cats for years, for the entire run. And I, moved, I said, I just moved to town. And he said, oh, you, you play really great. And I said, yeah, I just moved to town. And if you ever need a sub, that you're showing, he goes, you know, I'd love to have you in, but I would hate for Broadway to do to you what it did to me. And that, that's, you know, put a little jar into me at the moment. It was like, okay, well, there's something to this, you know, uh, uh, just kind of going, being like a factory worker, showing up. And uh, there's been many accounts of people, you know, that, that go to those types of positions. And if you're not careful and do other things or force yourself to practice other things, uh, you get to the point where you can play the show great, but that's all you can play. And, you know, it gets to that point where you just start, you get so comfortable with those notes in that same order every night, eight times a week. Um, it's, you know, that was frightening. Plus, I, I love to improvise, I love to play creative music, I love mm -hmm. to write. And so I did play Broadway shows for a while, but then uh, when other things in my career started taking off, I kind of let that go. That's a great story. I remember sitting, I got to sit in just to observe in the pit band of cats when it came to Utica. And, you know, the guys would play their parts, and then they'd pick up a book. And, sure. And I had never really witnessed that part of it before. and It was a bit of an eye-opener. Yeah, when you're playing a show, when you go to sub on a show, you first have to show, go up to the pit, or go down into the pit, and sit through a show watching the regular person play the show and watch the music go by and see what they're doing, and they give you little instructions here and there. And one of the first shows I went to watch uh, was something that had been running for a long time, and no one even had the music on the stand. They had magazines and stuff. So, you know, they gave me the music, I'm holding music, and everybody's got magazines on their music stands. They're reading the magazines actually while they're playing, you know? Ooh. So, yeah, so it's, it's, you get to that point where it's that, you're that separated from the music. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you were in eighth grade, I'm just going to pick eighth grade. Okay. Because it's an interesting time for a, you know, a young man. Did you have these aspirations then? 
I loved music and I loved the whole, uh, I loved the trombone and I loved uh, just the, the social aspect of the band. Uh, but I also loved the fact that it, it was something that I did pretty well and I felt like it could be, uh, you know, it, it was something that kind of get me out of my shell a little bit. And uh, I started messing around with writing a little bit. I had a, uh, a grand, uh, my uh, uncle. Uh, sent me um, a double album set of Tommy Dorsey, he's a big band. He said, if you play trombone, you should know who Tommy Dorsey is. So uh, I listened to that and uh, tried to transcribe one of the charts on the album. This is in eighth grade, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I'm trying to transcribe it off an LP, so you can imagine what it did to the record. But, uh, but that was a learning experience, and then, uh, you know, so it, it kind of started around that time, believe it or not, like 7th or 8th grade, where I was thinking, this is a lot of fun, I wish I could do this all the time, I didn't know you, that you could, could actually do it, but uh, I was hoping that there was some way I could continue playing, you know, that kind of music. Mm. Did, it, did it ever occur to you, or your parents, or your teachers, that there was another route besides going to music school? Or was that sort of understood if you wanted to pursue this career? Well, uh, my first trombone teacher I started with in, in ninth grade, and aside from about a year and a half, he took me all the way through the end of my high school days, um, was a kind of a freelance guy in, in Cleveland, Ohio, who uh, played with the, the big bands. He wasn't a classical player by any means, um, but he was he, one of the more uh, I guess you could say working musicians in the Cleveland area and uh, even on our lessons we never really practiced die-hard classical repertoire. We did technical things but then we would always end up playing like pop duets and things like that and uh, so I wasn't really exposed to that kind of element um, but when I really got interested in jazz and in music that's when I decided I want to continue. Was, jazz is what got me excited about it uh, but at the same time, I think it was kind of implied in my family that I was going to college. So uh, I said, well, I'm going to elect a major in music. And really, to be honest, I didn't think I was strong enough to be a performer at the time, so I majored in music education. Mm -hmm. uh, and then about halfway through my uh, studies at Ohio State University, my undergrad years, they started a jazz degree. And so mm -hmm. I started taking all the jazz classes, too. So I did two degrees, mm -hmm. jazz and music ed. And then, uh, with the hopes of getting good enough to get into a high-powered uh, grad school, uh, Eastman in particular, because when I was in high school, Woody Herman's band came to my school, did a concert in the clinic, and uh, I was super stoked because it was like, obviously a great band, and they were playing great classic literature, but they were also playing very modern things, mm -hmm. and the band was full of guys in their 20s. And I thought, wow, this is something that's not just, just nostalgia and from old records. And um, and I noticed Woody, Woody was getting a lot of his trombone players from Eastman. So I thought, well, that's, there's got to be something there to uh, to get me to the next step. So that was kind of my short-term goal, just to get good enough to get into Eastman, and then from Eastman kind of maybe find a way to get on Woody's band. Dang. Yeah. That was good planning. It was, it was pretty, pretty lucky calculations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you. I, I'm. I'm jealous because you lived. Uh, you did one of my. One of my dreams. I always wanted to be like in a big band. You know, one. One of the name. Um, and you became music director. Mm -hmm. What responsibilities did that entail for that band? Well, I wrote. For, at the time, I, I I took over for that. Uh, I wrote all the new charts. Uh, with a, a couple of, of exceptions, guys trying stuff on the band. But I wrote all the charts, and uh, anything new, I would rehearse the band. Woody would not be around. You know, we would work things up uh, without him around, and then he would just, he'd ask me if it was good enough to call on, on the gig. And so he'd hear it for the first time on the bandstand. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and then when we started recording, I would run the recording sessions and uh, uh, mix help mix the albums and all that stuff. So it was it was all on me. What he was really trusting with his uh, uh, musical directors and, and his sidemen for that matter. He never really told anybody how to play. He just trusted if you were good enough to be on his band you knew what to do. Talk about postgraduate education. Yeah, huh? yeah. Um, 
Did you ever have to be a disciplinarian? No, not really. Uh, I think in one rehearsal, because we, we always had to rehearse either after the gig or on a day off or something, and I remember one rehearsal prior to one of our albums where it was getting kind of late and guys were getting a little tired and cranky and yeah. I had to kind of clamp down for just a moment, uh -huh. but, but really not much. Yeah. Those, um, uh, is it safe to say that those stories about, you know, being on the, the band bus for many, many hours and all the, the bad habits that would come with that were pretty much in the past? Yeah, the, the, that really, we didn't really feel the effects of that. When I joined the band, it was kind of, it was the band to make fun of because before I got on the band, it was, there were, you know, you know I joined the band in 1980. So in the 70s, there were a lot of drugs. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Woody's early bands had some very hard drugs. Um, but when, when I joined the band, it was a bunch of, bunch of guys like myself in their early 20s. We just so happened five of us joined on the same day. Uh, so, which is almost half the band, or a third of the band, and uh, none of us did any of that stuff, and, uh, you know, we're taking vitamins, and it was like completely opposite. You know, you re I don't know if you recall, but in the 80s there was a big health surge where people were taking supplements and vitamins and mm -hmm. trying to exercise and things, you know, that was probably a result of everybody's parents having heart attacks and things <laughs> of 10 years before that. But, but uh, yeah, we, we were pretty healthy and pretty... I mean, we got in trouble as guys in their 20s do, but, but there was not that really mm -hmm. bad influence on the band anymore. Well, so can I uh, imagine you on the band bus with a score pad in front of you, and could you write in I that never really, I, I, No, I never really wrote on the bus while okay. I was moving. I would yeah. do it in the hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. I'd do it when we'd have a break or a day off. Um, I carried a little keyboard about this big, battery powered that I had in my suitcase, um, and which I still have. And I wrote with up until about three, four years ago, until I, I finally broke down and learned some computer programs. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it just, that was my comfort. It sounded really bad, but I knew if I could get a chord to sound really good on that thing, it would sound amazing with the band. Good point. And the keys were small, so I could fit the entire voicing within my two hands. I wouldn't have to reach or hold the pedal down or anything. I could just do that and hear all the voices, which was really helpful for me. I like that kind of story, that high, sort of low-tech, all you need is that little tool and, and then sure. it, it helps you to be creative. Yeah. Does does using um, Sibelius or Finale or whatever, does, do you think it's changed the sound of what you write? Uh, it did for a short time, I think. I mean, it, it probably be, probably would be inaudible to most people. Mm. But uh, it affected the way I write and the thought process. I had to find a way around, strangely enough, I had to find my way around the technology to get to the music. I mean, in, in the past, writing with pencil and paper, I'd have an idea and I could scribble on the page and just keep the pages turning so I'd have a feeling of forward mo momentum, you know, even if I didn't have the exacts, I could just scribble something, turn the page, and I could look back at it and, and just kind of keep the pencil going and make little notes as I'm going, so I have a feeling of this overall that you can't get with a computer, really. You can't, you can't do that because you have to take time and enter stuff, and there's no real way to scribble as of yet. I know they're working on uh, new stuff where you can do that, but, uh, but that Really trying to find a way around that. Fortunately, years and years and years of of writing by, with pencil and paper, I kind of figured out a technique for writing that I use. So I can I found had to find a way to have that translate to the electronic era. You know. Yeah. Um, and I'm st that's still something that's uh, you know I'm still working on. But uh, I have a new album coming out in August, and I think half of the music was written into. Uh, know, computer, directly into the computer. My, my thought was when I was learning the program was um, let's just do this cold turkey. And I wrote a chart with no keyboard, no keyboard, nothing, just I went, I went on the road for three weeks. I had a tour in Japan and I had several days off. I said, okay, I'm just going to learn this and try to write something. And I wrote it and it came out fine, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's not something, anything I put on an album or anything, but it came out fine okay. and it's, it's, you know, but now I have kind of an, a, a, a 
way to approach it where it doesn't, I don't feel stilted. You know, I've had occasions where I'm, I do some writing like that, and you almost accidentally, like, drag a note down or something in the third trombone part, and it lands on this thing, and then you play it back, and you go, oh, <laughs> I like that. Oh, here's just something, yeah. But you you almost feel like you're cheating because you don't really know what it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the advantages I find are, uh, if you want to hear something right away, you can hear yeah. it. I used to write everything pencil paper, and then I would enter it into a sequencer that had really good sound, so it would actually sound like the band, but it would take time. Yeah. Now I could write you know, two or three measures if I wanted to listen to the voicing or something, I'd just go back and, and kind of listen to it in context a little better in time, because I'm a horrible piano player. For original compositions for a big band, do you need to have the whole song first, like lead sheet, you know, melody and chords? Is that if I'm running for the big band, I... It, I guess it depends on the type of tune it is, but in general, in a general sense, yes. Uh, I need to have an idea of how it starts and how it ends, as far as the initial themes. You know, how I develop them over the course of the arrangement, that, that remains to be seen, what's going to happen. Um, but but the, the general sense of the ebb and flow of the melody and the, the, the form of the tune, I kind of got to have that to start with. I've actually... Uh, just recently started writing some things that I just, you know, just start writing and see where it goes. But because I don't have that visual of the, of the paper and pencil where I can like lay out four or five square pages and actually kind of visualize it, it's hard to do page by page. So that's, that's um, I'm still trying to work on it. I'm, I'm getting over that hurdle. How do you deal with the, the idea that introduction, melody, I have a bridge, bridge, maybe go back to, it's almost like A, A, B, A, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you do that much, and you get to this point, and then what? Do you have, uh, do you have things in mind where you can go other than just, okay, tenor solo? Uh, yeah, I, I usually try to do something where it's not predictable, kind of in, you know, eight bar phrases or whatever, and usually, Usually I kind of plan in my head before I start writing. Once I have the themes and, and the general sense of what the tune is, I, I kind of map it out in my head before I go to paper or to the computer, just as to what's, what the general idea is, what's, what's going to happen next. Like it, after the tune itself is over, is, it, is there going to be some type of send-off into a solo, or is there going to be a, an ensemble section that develops some of the themes, or is there going to be just come some kind of brief interlude, am I going to stretch the form, am I going to keep it squared off, you know, all those types of things. And usually, uh, because I've written so many other things in my life, if I, when I, always when I get to that point and I think of something, it's usually I'm trying to think of something I haven't done before. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you're going to do similar things, that's, people have the, their way of writing, but I always try to approach it in a way that lets if it's this kind of tune, and I've written this kind of tune before, when it gets to this part of this kind of tune, I don't want to do what I did on this or this. Uh, so I try to find new ways to do it either by... Uh, well, on, this, on the new album I have a blues, it's 12 bar blues, and after the tune, uh, there is a little bit of a send-off into a solo, but, but rather than it staying within the standard form of the blues, uh, I alter one of the phrases to be extra long. So so it's just enough to kind of throw you off. You think you're, you're expecting the, the four chord to come in bar in bar five, but it comes in bar six or something like that, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. From a logistical standpoint, uh, keeping a big band together must be a, a chore. It, it is because, uh, especially in a city like New York, there are very few venues that are large enough, that have a large enough stage to put a big band on. Um, and then you get to the point, especially as, you know, my band has had some notoriety, that you, you, you kind of don't want to undersell yourself and put yourself in a venue that uh, might be thought of as maybe a lesser venue to... to uh, 
because most of those don't pay, you know. And I'm I've gotten to the point where I'm I'm gotten to the point where my band actually gets paid to play, and I, I, if I don't if I, I don't feel right about asking my guys to play for free, number one, and I, number two, I don't want to pay for it completely out of my pocket. So, um, so there are certain performance venues that are there, but, but I avoid them because I know there's no way to you know, compensate my guys for what they're worth. Well, then there must have been a point early on where you were, the band was playing for nothing, or that you were... It was you, never nothing. Um, we played a club, when I first moved to town, we played a club called Visiones, which is no longer there. It was just around the corner from the Blue Note. And I think the guys made 25 bucks a night, yeah. something like that, 20, 25 bucks a night. Um, but to be honest, even, even in a, a really, one of the better clubs in town, they can't afford to guarantee a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even $100 a guy, I mean, that's $1,600 for a club to... You know, hope they're going to sell that many tickets is is a is yeah. a tough sell. Yeah. So uh, some of those places they they give you less, but give you a part of the door. So you you know you hope that you're going to bring in enough people yeah. to make it worth your while. Right. Or you tell the guys, here's the deal: we're guaranteed this. I can for sure give you 60 bucks, but it might be 150. You know, mm -hmm. depending on who comes. So tell everybody. You know, you know that's and that's an interesting thing too, because when the band first started, we were all kids. 20s, you know, 20s and 30s, and that's the time when you're getting out and having fun and hanging out late, and you know, guys are meeting girls, girls are meeting guys, and everybody's friends are coming to hang out and staying up late. Nobody's got any morning obligations. Nobody's got kids, so everybody in the band was having, you know, would have three, four, five friends come every time we played. Now it's like, well, my wife has to stay home with a kid, or you know, we got someone's got to walk the dog, or you know. All, all this stuff, so so it's a different it's a different type of thing now, you know. Well, that made me think of a Bill Holman told me that he was complaining to Woody Herman about a tempo that Woody chose for one of his charts, and Woody said to him, "Well, you know what I say to people who tell me it's like make your own band, yeah. get your own band. <laughs> yeah. So you have to pay a price to hear your tunes." That's I guess. right. That's right. Yeah, that's cool. So um, the studio work that you you did, including the pit band, that that's mostly like word of mouth. You you get into New York and you start subbing and you do a good job, hopefully, and then yeah, that's basically it. it's it's word. Of, I mean, uh, well, I was fortunate when I moved to New York. I had done two albums with Woody. They were both Grammy nominated. I was soloing on it. I wrote most of the music, so I could I came into town, and several people knew who I was. Mm -hmm. Which, which helped me get past a couple of those early painful stages a lot of people moving to a town fresh out of nowhere uh, have to deal with. So I was subbing on shows within a month of being in New York and uh, that got me in with the right group of people and I had people recommending. Within a year I was recommended to uh, tour with Jerry Mulligan and I met a whole bunch of people there and, and things like that uh, ha happened because I was with Woody. And, also because I was w with Woody for so long. I was touring with him for seven years. During that time, a lot of guys came and went, many moving to New York. So I had a, a whole network of folks I could draw on, at least for whether they could get me work or not. I, they could recommend who to talk to or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but once I got kind of doing the Broadway stuff, then the contractors kind of got wind of who I was because, you know, they have to pay everybody. and They see your name coming up on paychecks. Uh, okay, and then they ask about, oh, is this the guy? This okay, and then all of a sudden you're starting to get called for commercial dates or movie dates, or, you know, things like that. And and uh, there was one contractor who just recently passed away who had a little brass quintet, sextet, octet, um, that he would rehearse every Wednesday just so he could play. And uh, that was his way of getting to know people. And I played one rehearsal with him, and the next thing I know, I'm doing a movie date for him. So it's really who you meet and who hears you. And of course, that you have to play well, but you also have to do all the other things that most music students don't think about: is that you got to show up on time, you got to have uh, you know a decent, uh, you know, you have to have good hygiene, you know, you have to uh, dress right, you have to you know be cordial and know how to talk to people, and you know. All those things you don't study in music school, 
uh, how to make a first impression, basically. Um, and so that that uh, that came a little sooner than it would with a lot of people. Yeah. It's interesting you said that because I I wrote down this question I wanted to ask you what. What don't jazz students learn in school that they yeah. need to know? <laughs> People skills, basically, People is one skills. of this. You know, I, I, I talk, when I go to schools, I, I talk, I, I say, look, I look around this room. Someone in this room is going to get you a really good, good gig one day. So it would behoove you all to be very nice to everybody. <laughs> you know, because it may be someone who's playing, you know, third trombone in the third jazz band, and you're looking down at him, it's like, this guy's nothing and then later on well he's not playing anymore but he owns a jazz club because he because he loves jazz or he's an exec on a record label or something you know so all these things come back and and I try to tell students not only the people in this music school but you know try to interact with people outside of the music building because when you're talking to like record executives or, or uh, advertising people when you're playing a jingle for somebody you know they're they don't speak the language, the musical language. I mean, we get so used to talking to other musicians because it's comfortable. We can talk about the same kinds of things, but you know, sometimes you gotta, you have to deal with people that are not musicians, and the, if you can endear yourself to them, that's like gold in, in the music industry. You know, executives and and uh, you know, there are some contractors in New York that don't play, that are not musicians. They they wish they could be musicians, a lot of them, but they're not really players. So, uh, you know, just having a, a, a feeling of being able to interact with people comfortably, because, you know, the last thing you want to do is make someone uncomfortable. If you're making them uncomfortable, they're not going to want to have you around, so you're not going to get hired. So, you, it's, it's a, it's a lot of, that's a lot of what the music business is, because it's, it's, it's assumed everybody plays well. It's just assumed. If you're in New York as a professional musician, you've got to be a good player. So that's just an assumption. Everyone assumes that. It's all the other stuff that makes or breaks you. Oh, that, that's a great statement. It's like being in the NBA. There's no bad basketball players. Yeah, in the right. NBA, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I can imagine learning to like keep inside yourself certain things you want to say. Like if you're dealing with an ad exec or something that's just like thinks they know how to talk about yeah. music and they say stupid things and you want to like correct them but yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you can't you can't overstep that kind of stuff but you, yet you need to be personable and uh, mm -hmm. make a good impression do you have trouble keeping track uh, with all the things you do of money that's owed to you money that's owed to me uh, no not really I'm pretty pretty litigious about all that stuff and and I mean aside from when I first moved to New York there were a couple shady folks who I never got the money from, you know, mm -hmm. and you get to a point where you just kind of just say, okay, that's gone. I'm not going to work for that guy again, and I don't want to blow this up into a thing and have it bite me later. So, um, but no, it's, you know, you keep a calendar. You, you know, they tell you what it pays. You write it in your calendar or, you know, mm -hmm. put it in your computer. You have all the records of that. So uh, I've never really had a problem. And, and be, because being a freelance musician is somewhat hand-to-mouth, you're you're waiting for it many times. Yeah. 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 You could look at your income over the year and probably have peaks and valleys. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And it's totally unpredictable. I mean, there's always a peak in like uh, you know March, April, May, because that's I do a lot of work at schools, big concerts and things like that. Uh, but sometimes there's a giant peak in the middle of the year or toward the end of the year where uh, I do a tour with somebody or just happen to get a string of really nice things all, all in a row. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if I mapped out every year they'd all have a different look to them. How often do you have to, or do you, you have a, let's say, a one thing on some date and someone offers you ten days and that thing is right in the middle of it. Do you, do you ever have to call someone and say, look, I told you I was going to do this thing, but now I've got this opportunity. I've had a couple times. Uh, one time was a long time ago. I had a, a concert very uh, at a very small college, and it was just that. It was in the middle of something I got offered, like a 10-day tour or something that paid a lot of money. 
And so I called up to school, and it was well in advance. Mm -hmm. And I called up to school, and I said, look, I have this opportunity. I'd like to do it. Here are some people I would highly recommend. They're all trombone players. They all do what I do. They write, and then they would fit right in. They could even probably play the music you've been rehearsing of mine. They know my music, um, and they're well enough known. This was a long time ago. I wasn't very well known, mm -hmm. but they're, you know, uh, and so I worked, I, I worked out all the details for them. And I said, look, if there's a problem with the fee, I'll make up the difference, whatever, you know. Um, and then I took the other gig. And then the other one was uh, one that uh, I had a very nice gig at a school in, in Europe. Um, it was like a week-long residency with a concert at the end. And it was going to be a lot of work, but I was looking forward to it because it was a very prestigious program. Uh, but then I got called. This is like three or four months before I was going to get married. And I got an opportunity for something in town that, la that lasted like three months. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I felt bad enough leaving town for like 12 days or something when my wife trying to, to plan the wedding and everything. And at the same time, we're buying a house and moving and all that stuff. So I, I told the school, this is three, this is th three months before their event, I, I contacted the school and I said, I had this opportunity here and I'm going to have to uh, decline your offer. There were no formal contracts or anything. And um, they were a little upset about it, even though they, they had plenty of time and they did find someone to, to cover what it was I was going to do and he did a great job and they were very happy. But there was a little bit of uh, animosity there which I, I feel bad about because I was very excited about doing it, but at the same time it, it was... Yeah. And it turned out the opportunity I stuck around in New York for, uh, it was a, it was like a, a review. It was on Broadway, but it wasn't really a Broadway show. It was a music, real music kind of review with a big band on stage and everything. And uh, it paid New York uh, Broadway scale, so I played paid pretty well. But it didn't run as long as it was going to run. So I, I made about as much as I would have made doing the other gig, and probably would have had more fun doing the other gig, but. I just didn't, you know, at the time it just felt like, come on, this is, you're getting married, you're buying a house, you're moving, let's, let's be a responsible adult here and not just leave town for two weeks and leave your wife holding the bag. So, but that was the only, those are the only two yeah. times I really had to yeah. deal with that. Has it been your experience with, uh, you know, with all the musician friends you have, is it, is it a hard um, life to have long-lasting relationships? I think it depends on the person, and it depends on your vision for what your career is going to be. I think if uh, you're a stone-cold uh, artist, you know, and you, you don't want to uh, make any compromises with what, what your artistic goal is, regardless of what's nece necessary to keep your relationship alive or your marriage together or, or whatever, then it's going to take its toll because, because uh, you know, but uh, it's nice because she understands the uh, trials and tribulations of being a professional freelance artist. Uh -huh. um, but it is tough. I, I know a lot of people that have gone through tough times and, uh, and or had to give up a little of their dream to uh, be responsible adults and take care of their wife and family and, uh, you know, maybe raise their... Uh, level of how they live, you know, their lifestyle might, uh, you know, their family might not be somebody worthy of living in a shoebox with roaches and rats, you know. So, you, you know, you, you play the gigs that, that pay the money to keep, that put you in the right position to be able to take care of your family, and that's, that's the responsible thing to do. So, and some people are fine with that, and some people harbor some animosity because they've had to give up some of those things, and then that takes its toll on the marriage. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a tricky little balancing game. Uh, to be honest, I'm just as happy sitting at home and being with my wife and my dogs as I am playing a gig. So it's not, it's not uh, anything that's rubbing me the wrong okay, way. Okay, that's yeah. great. <laughs> I'm going to play a, a couple things here. This is from one of, I guess we could call, one of your contemporaries. Okay.
time. Unmistakable within the first couple of measures that it was Bill Watrous. Yeah. Okay, tell me why. First of all, I appreciate you considering me one of his contemporaries, but Bill's like 20 years older than me. I know. And has had a, a glorious career. Still alive, um, which is yeah, it's, it's yeah. Great. And I've had some wonderful opportunities to hang out with him and and play music with him and talk with him on the phone. And uh, he was very supportive of me early on during my days with Woody Herman. I know I still have a copy of it. There was an interview with him. Uh, Leonard Feather did an interview with him in the L.A. Times, and he Leonard Feather asked about new people coming up, and he he mentioned me and you know my writing and all that. And I was in New York and. I, uh, someone sent me the article, and I saw it, and I said, wow, this is amazing. So I wrote him a letter, you know, not thinking anything. I just wrote him a letter, thank you so much, and, you know, you were a big influence over the years, and, you know, he called me up, out of the blue, you know, like, shocking. You know, I'd never met him before. So, really good guy, and uh, unbelievable technique, and when I was in high school was when his his first big band records were coming out. And it was super inspirational because kind of like Woody Herman with all the young guys, his group was kind of doing more like modern kind of Latin music and, and rock contemporary rock and things like that that were, were not really done with a lot of the older big bands. So, and of course, all featuring trombone. How could I not like that, you know? So, uh, he was one of my early influences in, in, in high school. My first one was Irby Green, um, but but Bill definitely uh, that first big bound album I got of his, the Wildlife uh, Manhattan Wildlife Refuge, uh, where he does his crazy uh, uh, cadenza on this one too. Mm -hmm. It was just like, how does anybody have that much technique? Unbelievable. Yeah, I remember watching in college some a rare video. It's not well before everything was. You know, YouTube wasn't thought mm -hmm. of, but sure. this is watching this guy play with his Prince Valiant haircut and like, what is and com <laughs> How's that possible? Seemingly completely effortless when right. he plays, you know. Um, it, it really knocked me out. And so I was I was really getting into him and with Irby and and then someone said, well, you know, Bill Watrous, his, his influence is Carl Fontana. So I said, oh, who's Carl Fontana? And at the time, Carl had no albums out under his own name. He didn't record any albums under his own name until like 1986 or something like that. So I had to hunt for it. And the first album I found was uh, um, Super Sax, uh, Super Sax album that he's featured on five, four or five tunes. Then he did a co a, a co, co led album uh, live at the Concord Jazz Festival, Hannah Fontana Band with Jake Hanna. Um, so that he did that. Technically, I guess he led that group. Um, but I, I wore those albums out because right? I, I realized, okay, Bill, Bill was on something here. This is, this is the source, you know. And, and the one thing I knew early on was I, did, I didn't want to sound exactly like anybody. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well, let's, let's do what Bill did. We'll go back, we'll listen to Carl, and we'll, we'll see how that affects what I do through what I've been studying with Irby. And obviously I discovered J.J. At that, by that time and Curtis Fuller and all these people. And Carl's first, the first thing that struck me was this, his, the way he played time. His eighth note feel, how relaxed everything was, it really, that really took to me immediately. And that's really what I wanted to go for there. So I was, he kind of, I kind of put him up on a pedestal for, for quite a long time, um, really trying to get close to, to his way of phrasing. Not the way he played notes, I mean, I played similar things that he played, but I wasn't about like transcribing everything he did and playing it note for note. I wanted to just kind of get a sense for what what his approach was in, in, in as far as inflections and time feel and all that stuff. Yeah. Great. Here's some. Here's a guy who's uh, I think I think somewhat younger than you. <laughs> The one spot you could tell us him. Yeah, he's this, another guy with just a freaky set of chops. He can, be, I mean, technically he can go anywhere, um, and a lot of energy and a lot of air. 
Yeah. Pretty, I, I've been working with him over the past, uh, I don't know, six years now, I guess. Uh, every year in January, I do this thing called the Jazz Cruise, yeah. which is um, an entire giant cruise ship dedicated entirely to jazz. No other entertainment on the boat. No Broadway shows, no silly whatever, someone making balloon animals. It's all, it's all jazz. And uh, they bring out all these great players. And uh, I first did it in 2009. Uh, and they used to always bring a big band on, in addition to all these collection of guys playing small groups all over the ship. And in 2009, they, de they decided, let's try putting all these guys together for the big band. We'll have like an all-star big band. And I was just a side man at the time. Uh, Ken Petblowski, a clarinet player, was leading the band. And uh, after, about it, after that year, he, in, he invited me back. And um, he said, you know what, you know, bring some charts. And I, this is getting to be a little bit too much for me because he was doing everything. He was setting up all the entertainment. He was playing. He was running the big band. He said, let's split off. You know, you, you take a couple nights, I'll take a couple nights. And then after we did that year, he said, you know what, it's yours. You know, I'd rather just play. And so I've been leading that band for since, since then. And uh, the first couple of years Wycliffe did it, but he's always on the ship, but he's, he's not always in the big band. Uh -huh. But uh, what a fantastic talent, really great guy too. Yeah. Does your wife get to go on the... Believe it or not, she plays in the band as oh, well. Oh, right. When uh, Ken, hired, <clears throat> Ken hired me to do the band, it was supposed to be me and Wycliffe and Andy Martin and John Allred. That was going to be the trombone section. And Andy Martin got some kind of movie date and had to cancel. And Ken said, I need to get a fourth trombone player. And I said, well, you probably should get a bass trombone player. I said, you know all the guys in New York to get, you know, you know the top guys. But just so you know, in case you don't have someone, uh, my plus one is my wife. And she's a great bass trombone player. She plays with this guy and this guy and this group and that group. And uh, she plays really well. So if you get hung up, he goes, oh, let's just do that. So he hired her. And then she came on the boat. And everybody loved her. And she did a bang-up job. And actually, she got hired back for the next year before I did. So uh, she's, she plays with a lot of great groups in, in Manhattan. She's fantastic. Great. Her name's Jennifer Wharton. Okay. War Warden? Wharton. Wharton. Yeah. W-H-A-R-T-O-I. Yeah. You used a term just now that I don't think I've heard, plus one. I mean, instead of having three trombones, you need four? Is that what you mean? Or are you just talking about... I was talking about my guest on the ship. You're invited on the ship, oh. and you're allowed to bring a guest. Okay. So she was my plus one. Plus one. Yeah. Nice. Very you good. You know how people put it in the guest yeah. list. John okay. Fetchock, plus one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'd like to be a plus one. <laughs> okay. Here's one last uh, selection. That's me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And do you like it? <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I remember when I was on Woody's band, I, I, uh, there were some other guys from Eastman that came out after I had joined the band. And they had some recordings of Eastman's band. And I was sitting, you know, we're all riding in the bus, and as most people did at that time, you'd had headphones on, you'd be listening to music. And I remember I was listening, and then I heard like, some somebody playing something else without headphones over there, and it was like a trombone solo, and it sounded interesting. I took my head, headphones off. And, oh, that's me. <laughs> so let's. I guess. I guess I liked it. You know, sometimes I like hearing myself. Sometimes I really don't. Sure. You know, it's just like listening to your own voice on the answering machine or something. It's. It's. It never sounds quite like you expect it to yeah. sound. I would want to come back to that thought regarding your band too, but. Um, that's pretty complex, and I wonder if you can tell me what you're thinking about when you improvise. Uh, first and foremost, I think I'm thinking about the line, the melody, that, you know, that I'm playing. That it's that it's. that it's uh, informed by the harmony, but it also has the direction that the harmony wants it to go. Where the, the voice leading of the line, the, the direction of the uh, resolution of the chords, it, it, it all makes sense within that, you know. So if I'm, cross, if I'm playing a line and I cross into a bar line, it's almost like you can hear the key signature change when you, 
when you cross into that new court. And it's usually by some relationship of a half step or some kind of resolving note, like a seventh resolving to a third, or a third resolving to a seventh, or sharp nine resolving to a thirteen, or something like you know, you know, from the different stratas of resolution. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep that in mind, but at the same time, I want to create a line that if I if I create tension in, in the line somewhere, I always want to make sure that that tension is somewhere along the line, readdressed and released. And that, that and that it's not necessarily a, a completely cognizant thing at this point in the way I play. It's something that I just hear and I know it's got to go a certain way. And there may be two or three steps in between here and here, but eventually it ends up. You know, like I'll play some kind of note that sticks out, and then I go down here. I'm not going to leave it hanging. I'll eventually go back up and pick it up and, and move back down. That's just kind of, uh, regardless of how much I, I alter the harmony or what kind of substitution, chord substitutions I use, I'm always trying to think about, you know, these, these tension notes. They're there for a reason. You know, just to play tension notes just for the sake of tension, you, the great thing about music is tension and release. So they all serve a purpose. Like that seventh, it, there's a strong pull to go to the third, you know, on, on a 5 1 relationship. Mm -hmm. So the same thing goes for a lot of the upper extensions. I feel, I feel there's a, a very strong resolution to a lot of these things. So even if I'm not consciously thinking of it, now I'm to the point where I'm subconsciously remembering that note and coming back up to take care of whatever I left hanging. I really like that and you're, you sort of I think answered my next question was uh, about wrong notes in improvising. And I think you sort of just addressed it already. Sure. Yeah, I mean there are certain, certain notes that sound better than others but but to be honest any note can be played over any chord if if it's approached from the right note and leads to the right note. So, if you don't, does it constitute... You know, this term wrong note, I know is, uh, is debatable, but if, if you were teaching a lesson and, and someone's playing a note that really doesn't quite belong and they're not either justifying it or setting it up, right. would you say to that student, that could be done better or something. Oh, of like course, that. yeah. I, and I would, I would say it's not a wrong note, but it's, it's a wrong way to play that note over that chord. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain way to get to that note. If you're going to go, just go for it and have it sound really wrong, which a lot of great players have done, you've got to have some way to skillfully tell everybody you meant to do that and it wasn't a mistake. Um, and you have to have the presence of mind, you have to to be able to do that and you have to be relaxed enough to do that and you have to be comfortable in your own skin enough. You know, it's like using the wrong word in a sentence. Some people might completely freeze up, you know, if they had the camera on them or if they're public speaking. You know, it's the same type of thing. But if you, you know the word's wrong and you kind of just kind of correct yourself and move on, it's fine. Everyone understands what you were trying to say. It's fine. Um, or to the extreme, look at uh, someone like Norm Crosby. You knew exactly what he was talking about. I don't know if you're familiar with him as a comedian. Yeah. Okay. He was the king of the malapropisms. He would use the wrong word. And, and, but you'd still know what he was talking about. And it was funny because it was the wrong word, but you know what he's talking about. Well, when I hear, when I listen to some, any number of people, I think of Dizzy Gillespie sometimes. And sometimes he plays something, I go, my God, I, I never would have thought of that. And it, until you maybe listen to it again, it didn't sound right. Yeah, yeah. But, but what's interesting with Dizzy, when you hear him play, there is so much forethought in what he did. When he does those notes, you can hear the intent. It's not an accident. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's someone like Miles Davis who would, I would, in, in my mind, I think he would intentionally play wrong notes to get his rhythm section to creatively find a way to make something happen. And that's the thing, if, you, if you're going to play those notes from out of the key or from whatever, however you want to describe it, um, 
you need to have a sensitive, sensitive rhythm section. If you have someone just banging out the chords, you know, one, you know, one, three, five, seven, nine, like this, and you play this stuff, and they don't follow you, it's going to sound wrong, no matter how your intent is. So you, it, there's got to be a give and take in that communication within the rhythm section too. The people that are accompanying you, if they don't have the facility, like if I I played with many groups, uh, pickup groups where you can just tell the piano player is not going to go there, no matter what you do, and sure you can do it and you can feel good. Okay, this is my thing. I'm going to do my thing, but musically it doesn't make sense. You know, it's like it's like sitting sitting in a room with three garbage men and, and, and trying to talk quantum physics. You know, you're not going to have a good conversation. You may be 100% right, but what, what's it doing for the conversation? Nothing. So in those cases, I just reel it back and I say, okay, well, I'm just going to play more straight ahead and enjoy being in that box tonight. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a challenge in itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I learned a lot about doing that working with student groups because they don't have a lot of facility. So you've got to be able to create interesting solos and, and uh, something that feels different and fresh based upon very basic information mm -hmm. that they're supplying you as an accompaniment. Well said. <laughs> when I was at uh, Fredonia, this was late 60s, early 70s, we used to put on uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears in Chicago and for our age group at that time, like, oh man, I want to do that. Sure. Did you ever have that? Did you have a band? Or a, for, for you, was, was it more the big bands? That was my first uh, inspiration, although I did listen to groups like that. I had Chicago Records and Blood, Sweat and Tears Records and things like that. And I got to work with Blood, Sweat and Tears when I moved to New York a few times. Um, but it was more it was more the straight ahead jazz that inspired me, and I'm not I'm not sure what why that was, but it was. I mean, I liked all the all the more modern stuff. I listened to the Maynard Ferguson albums in the '70s, you know, when he was doing all the rock stuff, and it was a lot of that stuff was very interesting to me, and I thought it was great. But but um, I think it was because I wanted to be an improviser, and all the great improvisers played over straight ahead music. All the all the people I wanted to sound like played over straight ahead music at the time. So uh, I just got more and more into that. Uh -huh. And I realized that there's more and more to that. I mean obviously Blood, Sweat and Tears had a lot of great jazz harmony, as did Chicago. Mm -hmm. But as far as the soloists go, they weren't unleashed as much as they right. were in jazz. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a shame sometimes when you hear Blood, Sweat and Tears on like the oldie station or whatever. They always snip out those middle parts with the extended, with, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's sad to hear. <laughs> You, you, you strike me as a, a fairly uh, even-keeled guy. I wonder if there's anything that really gets on your nerves musically. Uh, I'm not one for uh, showboating or uh, um, one-upsmanship on the bandstand. You know, people that play, uh, you know, for sport. You know that are that are more. It's more like a competition than a, a you know a sharing kind of a thing. Some of my favorite players are the guys that if you even on like instruments. They're you know my favorite trombone players to play with are the guys where you play something and the other guy doesn't feel ob obligated to play it back better or higher or faster. You know, and there are a lot of cases of people doing that where you don't really feel like you're making music together. It's just like. People, you know, it's, it's you know, for, uh, for lack of a better term, excuse my French, but a pissing contest, you know? And I get to the point where that really turns me off, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually just kind of revert to staying out of the game. So you got one guy all over the place, and one guy just, okay, let's calm down here, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't make for good a good program, but I just, I can't live in that, in that realm. That's the, kind of not my personality. I, found out a long time ago that's not my personality. Okay. So uh, that's the only thing. It doesn't make me mad, it just, it's just disappointing because you want to make music. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get in those situations and it's like, oh, okay. And that is the mentality in a lot of those festival type atmospheres. They want to hear everybody, you know, pitted against everybody and then, you know, you know, uh, 
Battle of the Bones or you know things like yeah. you know so you know but I, I, I it's it's much more fun to me when it's just like we're playing music you yeah. do your thing I do my thing and 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 let's just kind of make it work like you would if you're talking to somebody you know have you ever um, gotten into done any of the, the jazz parties yeah I've done some of those yeah. sure okay. yeah those are fun they are, yeah and they don't usually descend into that right exactly you know, and that's what the jazz cruise is like that as well it's everybody's kind of just having a great time and nobody's got an agenda right leave your agenda on the, on the at the doorstep at the doorstep yeah yeah right <laughs> yeah we got to go on one of those things i thought i was in heaven yeah didn't know if such a thing existed you know here's joe williams and oscar peterson sure. and nat yeah. adderley like <laughs> yeah that was and it's something. great for the musicians too because it's rare that we have more than just a time to say hello, how, how's it going, what's been going on, you, you actually, when I'm on the ship, you know, you can have long, you know, fairly meaningful conversations with these guys that you haven't really had a chance to say much other than how's the weather, you know? Yeah, and you don't have to talk about music all the time, yeah, exactly. because you get a little bit more time. Yeah. yeah. Gee. If you could uh, increase one of the things that you do right now. You're also doing some producing and mm -hmm. would, would you increase one more thing as, as opposed to something else? Uh, well, it's, my first love was always playing so I guess it would be playing. You know, it's hard. Uh, when I'm writing I, I usually have to let the playing take the back seat and I don't practice as much and I don't occasionally won't take gigs because if I'm trying to finish a project or whatever and uh, I kind of, you know, I miss it. I miss it. So I, I miss writing less. If I'm if I'm playing a bunch and I'm not writing, I don't miss not writing. I, I don't miss writing. Um, but if I'm not playing, I really miss it. Okay. And it actually affects me psychologically too. Mm -hmm. I, I I get fidgety. I'm not I'm not relaxed. Uh, I'm just I'm not as happy a person. Mm -hmm. If you get a call to do a commission, are there guidelines? that you like to get for instance if someone says i have a big band write something for me that's very wide open yeah is it is it harder to do it that way than to say you know i really could use a a latin chart and i have a strong trumpet section yeah it's not it's uh i don't say i don't want to say it's harder i would say there's a higher chance greater chance that what i do may not fit this person's group. Uh, if they say, we don't care, just write something, and they give me no limitations, I'm going to write for my own band, and then and then give them the chart, they'll pay me for it, and then I'll play it with my group and record it, you know, so so I usually require guidelines, because I want everyone to be happy, and I want the word of mouth to be that we asked them to write something, it came out great, and it was perfect for our group, you know, so I usually ask about you know the talent in the group and the limitations and uh, who the soloists are, what uh, you know stylistically what the band can handle things like that, and uh, so far I've hit the mark on all of them. But occasionally you'll get a, a director who maybe has a loftier impression of what his group is, mm -hmm. and. Uh, maybe bites off a little more than you get true for his group, you know, saying that they can do something when they're really not prepared to do that. Um, but I, I, I always kind of take things with a grain of salt depending on how confident the director sounds when he's saying all these things. Um, but in general, I, the ultimate goal is that I write something for them that they're happy with and then I also get to play with my group. Yeah. Kills two birds with one stone. And how you decide on what to charge uh, I have kind of a standard fee, yeah. and then I tell the, tell the group, look, you know, especially if it's a group that's, you know, professional group or a you know, highly touted university group, if it's something that I could really don't have a lot of limitations to, then I'll, you know, you know I'll, I'll work with you. If you, if you. if you can't afford my price, you know, let me know what you can't afford, maybe we can meet in the middle or something like that, or uh, um, if you wouldn't mind. You know, some, some places ask you to rent them a chart and then say, and, and tell me it's got to be an exclusive. Like, I can't play with my group, I can't have it published. And if I, they want an exclusive for, for their group because they're paying all this money, I understand completely. So, 
uh, with that, you know, the, I've, I've set my price a little differently and you know, things like so. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, just to wrap up here, um, there's uh, every year there's thousands of graduates of jazz schools coming into the market. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, outlook for them? Depends where you go, I guess. It seems, uh, I think in another 10 years, we're going to really find out what happens with all this because for the past 15 years, all these jazz programs have been supplying new teachers for the jazz programs. So you've got a lot of really, really good teachers in jazz programs now, much more accomplished uh, than the old days. You've got a lot of great jazz programs everywhere. But then the question is, where does everybody else go now that all these jobs are filled? Um, there's no more road bands. So the answer is a lot, of, a lot of people are either getting into one of the military bands or doing cruise ship work, things like that. You can't even move to a place Las, to like, like Las Vegas anymore and make a living uh, very well. So it's, it's a very different thing. New York is probably one of the few places where anybody that's got anything together can move to New York and eke out a living because there's so many different things going on. You've got Broadway, you've got live work, you've got a, a club date scene, which club dates is playing weddings and things like that. Uh, in, in New York, it's like beyond professional level. You know, these giant weddings and they play with these 10-piece groups that are slick and polished, giant sound systems and all that stuff. And, uh, that's a big, big uh, uh, industry in New York. Um, and there's just a lot of live venues and, and live gigs and there's orchestras and symphonies and uh, the opera and all that stuff. There's there's plenty of little places where guys can kind of combine all this stuff to make make a living doing this and that and this and that. Uh, Los Angeles I think is a little more smaller scope. It's got the studio scene and a little bit of live work that maybe tours but uh, it's mostly commercial music for the most part and uh, not a lot of jazz clubs out there so it's it's kind of not as multifaceted mm -hmm. as New York, so um, we'll see, we'll see. But uh, I I think I tell students all the time. I mean, teachers say, "How can? Uh, what do you say to these students that want to be musicians?" I say, "Well, if they're like me, there's no choice. I had to be a musician. There was nothing else I wanted to do. I would have been miserable being anything else. So you got to take your shot." And uh, if, if you apply yourself and, and do all the right things, you're going to make you a success of yourself. And if you don't, then it's on you. And uh, so I, I, think, I think there's still room for people. Uh, the Broadway scene in New York is very healthy right now. A lot of musicians making really good livings. And, uh, you know, it's, music's everywhere. And it's just, uh, you, you may have to modify your standard of living a little bit when you first move to a city. And you know, a lot of students are not comfortable with that concept. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how this all... Now that all the teaching jobs are fill, filled, we'll see what happens uh, okay. with the rest of the crew. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> I really enjoyed talking to you today. Likewise, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.